Okay. This is an original course that I myself devised and decided to offer because it reflects some of my interests, bringing together, I suppose, aspects of modern history, uh, the sort of early modern period and pre-genocide, certainly, history and cultural history, um, combining my interest in Armenian Constantinople, the Mechitarists in Venice and Vienna, the Armenian evangelist movement, and particular publications uh, which include the uh, magazine Kuragan, founded and edited by my grandfather's grandfather, Stepan Utugian, and the, as it called itself, Yegeretsa Kidagan, ecclesiological weekly journal, Luis, that appeared every week for two years, in 1905 and 1906, supervised by the then patriarch Marakia Ormanyan, but the uh, person in charge was uh, Zairakuin Vartabed uh, Papken Güleserian, who later became Atoragitz Gatorigos, Catholicos coadjutor, who reigned in parallel with the more elderly Sahag Gatorigos of the Great House of Cilicia. After the Cilician throne had to be moved from Sis and eventually settled in Antilias in Lebanon, where it continues to exist. And yet another publication, which is of great interest to me, uh, and that's Chok Yevchosk. Thoughts and words, it sounds very prosaic in English. The memoirs completed in 1918 by the former patriarch of Constantinople by this stage, Archbishop Marakia Ormanyan, which I knew about, what, but which I had not seen until back in 2010 or 11, I think 2010, I went to Constantinople and from Puzant Akbash's uh, antique book shop, I bought the Dundesian Himmel and this book. And this book I translated with my father into English in its entirety. But I need to edit and annotate the translation. But believe me, it reads like a detective book, like, like, a, like, a, th like a thriller. Uh, because Ormanyan had an extremely interesting life and he wrote about it with what I genuinely believe is great honesty and sincerity. But he was also a highly educated, very clever chap, very close to the corridors of power in all sorts of uh, senses and uh, places. And so, and as you know, I'm very close to the Mechitarist congregation, both in Venice and in Vienna, both of which are places I go to for research purposes, both for their medieval manuscripts and for their more recent uh, traditions, not least their musical traditions. Uh, I'm so keen to give this lecture now that I'm actually missing now Vespers, which they have started broadcasting from San Lazaro as they do every evening or almost every evening. And I count uh, uh, many of the monks as being my friends. So all these things I wanted to bring together because all these things do uh, two or three things. First, they allow us to get a feel for what was happening with maybe one of the most brilliant periods and milieu of Armenian culture. Um, it's very impressive what was achieved culturally in the arts, also in the sciences, actually. 
uh, creatively, intellectually, spiritually. Uh, and these various elements all came together. They stimulated each other. They enriched each other. Maybe they even provoked each other, particularly if we think of the Armenian Catholics and the Protestants. They forced the Armenian Orthodox uh, to get their act together. And the second thing is they make one, this sounds very banal and an understatement, but they make you feel extremely sorry that the genocide happened and all this was destroyed. You will tell me, how can you say such a thing? Aren't you sorry that so many people died? Aren't you sorry that all that property, all that material wealth was lost? Of course, I'm sorry, but I'm, if possible, even more sorry about the vibrant cultural life and creativity and capacity for enjoyment uh, that is evident if you look, if you read through the pages of what some of these journals express and document. You even get that feeling of their vigor, how alive this culture was, how rich it was, and it was getting richer all the time, how exciting the times were. And of course, that makes the loss all the heavier because the loss of property and of material wealth is something that can be reversed. But these things that were destroyed, they, they were really destroyed and I fear irreversibly. But the purpose of the course is not to make you sorry. The purpose of the course is to wonder at the good things that were there before they were destroyed. The course is not about the genocide. Although when we read the genocide is partially covered because although Ormanian reminisced about his life, um, there is much that happens pre-genocide. Um, he was not just a witness, but a participant as well. Uh, but he wrote his memoirs during the genocide when he himself was displaced. He was deported. He had to go to Damascus, then to Jerusalem. Um, so all that is of very great interest. And the final thing, uh, I mean, these are just a few of the main points, but um, there are more. But the final thing that I want to mention now is, particularly upon your reading the Ormanian memoirs, the question comes to mind. He, he doesn't say this at all, but as a result of reading it, the question comes to mind. Is there any way Armenians might have played their cards differently, done something differently, as a result of which the genocide might perhaps not have happened? It's a question that presents itself. I don't know the answer. I had a little discussion about this with Marek Yandak after Arpine left time, but it not part of this course, and we don't have time to do that today. But he then quickly goes through this thing. This was planned as a course of 15 hours or 18 hours, something like that. And I'm going to give you a little summary just in three quarters of an hour now, if that. So everything will be superficial, but I, I will give you a, a skeleton, and I hope that will suffice for now. Um, so it was the Ottoman Armenians in the uh, in the era of the great patriarchs, Osmanski Armenia, the Erje Belkich Patriarchu. Uh, and yes, there were six three hour lectures planned, 18 hours in total. So I'll go through some of this very quickly. 
you, I think, received from me by email this bibliography as well. The good thing is that most of this material is readily available. Um, or will become so. But every single issue of Puragan, you can download from the website in PDF form from the website of the National Library of Armenia. Um, Askabadum, which is the history of the Armenian church, accompanied in effect by history of the Armenians in three large volumes, scans of it may be had. Um, the book published on the occasion of the 300th anniversary of the, of the foundation of the Mechitarist order on San Lazaro. It was founded in 1700 or 1701, but they were, they took their seat, uh, their permanent uh, main location on the island of San Lazaro in Venice in 1717. So there's a French volume that is also available. It is still in print. Louis, which was a weekly that was published over two weeks in Constantinople, happily was reprinted in two large volumes by the Catholic estate of the Great House of Cilicia in 1987. Uh, and that's the version that I have. I've, I've bought the two volumes. I've got them on my shelves in Prague. And I believe they're still available if anyone wants them. Um, the book by Stepan Utigian, I'm not sure if it is available uh, in PDF form, but I've got a photocopy I made uh, almost 20 years ago in Armenia, and I can scan or photograph the photocopy if anyone wants it. But also, uh, Professor Kasuni, an elderly gentleman now based in the Lebanon, but he contacted me a year ago actually uh, nine months or so ago, saying he's preparing a new critical edition of that volume, which was, uh, it, it's a book that was written by my grandfather's grandfather, Stepan Itujian, The History of the Armenian Evangelical Movement. And Kasuni wants to prepare a new edition of it. And he said, I read in the Constantinopolitan Jamanag newspaper, where I had done an interview, February. No, sorry, in October. I've read, he said, that you teach ancient Armenian at Charles University. Well, I'm working on a new edition of your great great grandfather's book, and um, there are a lot of quotations from various theologians in Karapaj, in ancient Armenian. The biblical ones I have translations for, but everything else I want you to translate. So I did, but uh, then there were problems in the Lebanon and I don't know if the book is being published or not, but there will be a new edition, all being well, God willing. And Professor Kasun himself is rather elderly, but I hope he will have a lot of good health and a uh, long, fruitful time ahead of him still. What Kasuni already did was something that really amazed me because I didn't know it existed. It seemed that my great, great grandfather, Stepan Ikitan, had kept a diary in manuscript form. And it seems that the manuscript or a photocopy of it, or no, the manuscript was taken to the United States some evangelical Armenians took it with them. And a photocopy of it was sent to Kasuni in the Lebanon. And he transcribed my great great grandfather's diaries, published them with a substantial introduction and a lot of notes. I found out on the internet about 10 years ago that he has published that. And I ordered a copy and I got it and I read it. So my great-great-grandfather, great, great Stepan Tujan, uh, has become very close to me because I, I already had read one book of his. Then I found out that for 
a very long time. He, for over two decades, he edited and wrote a lot of the articles in Puragam. So you get something about the personality of the man and then the diaries. Uh, and he was very much in the center of things for reasons which I'll explain. Ormanian also is close, also in a familial sense, in that my late maternal grandfather, Hagop, um, Kökcian, um, studied with Ormanian in Jerusalem. Um, my grandfather, Hagop Kökcian, whom I never met, alas, and whom not even my mother remembers, because he sadly died at a young age when she was barely four years old. But he was Cilician. He was from Alexandret. But fortunately, both he and his older brother served in the local church. And when the genocide started, Armenian young men were being uh, cons conscripted ostensibly to join the Ottoman army, but in fact, they would be taken to be killed. But there was a rule that said that servants of the church do not have to join the army. And my grandfather's older brother happened to have an old photograph of his serving in the church. So he said to the governor, I am a servant of the church. And he said, prove it to me. And he showed a photograph of his being dressed in the deacon's clothes. And so he was allowed to escape. He reached Jerusalem. Once he reached there, he arranged for his younger brother, my grandfather, also to go there. So my younger, uh, so his younger brother, my grandfather, studied in Ormanian's theology class in Jerusalem. At the same time that Ormanian was writing his Choch and Chos, he was teaching my grandfather theology. And in fact, my grandfather repeated the class to stay there for one more year to avoid being conscripted into the Ottoman army. And that saved his life. We also have a publication of the theology notes that Ormanian was using to teach. Both his theology notes and his Yevchosk um, were published posthumously. So, so much by way of an introduction. First, let's start with the Armenian Patriarchs. The Armenian Patriarchate was founded only, what, eight years after the Ottomans um, conquered Constantinople. Until then, the Armenian church was not allowed to have a presence in Constantinople because in Byzantium, the Armenians were considered to be heretics. There was a small number of Chalcedonian Armenians in Constantinople, but the Armenian Orthodox Church was not represented. But when the Sultan conquered Constantinople, shortly afterwards, he encouraged Armenians to move to Constantinople. They were considered to be the loyal element and he used the Armenians to decrease the influence of the Greeks. The Greek Orthodox Church was also allowed to stay where it was. And it was the Sultan Mehmed II who invited the prelate of Brusa, which is a city not very far from Constantinople. And it's where my great grandfather was born because his father, Stefanitijan, of whom we spoke, served as a Protestant pastor, as an evangelical pastor in Brusa when he was born. So the Sultan invited the, arch the, the, the um, prelate of Brusa to Constantinople and made him a patriarch, Hovagim I. There is a, an unbroken chain of 84 Armenian patriarchs of Constantinople. 75 of them served during the Ottoman Empire. 
initially, the Sultan would nominate the patriarch. Gradually, the system became more liberalized and the Amirah uh, had a say in his choice. The Amirah were close to the Ottoman court and even to this day, the state has to approve and the state has rather restrictive rules about who can be and cannot be uh, the Armenian Patriarch of Constantinople. Nowadays, they say of Istanbul, but anywhere outside Turkey, he's referred to as the Armenian Patriarch of Constantinople. Now, the three patriarchs who are of greatest interest to us are Golod, Nalyan, and rather more recently, Ormanyan. Hovannes Golod is remembered to this day. He founded two printing presses and under his own direction, 80 Armenian books were published in Constantinople. He founded schools. He founded a Tabrats Tas, uh, a Skolna Kantorum. All this had long lasting effects. Hagop Nalyan Patriarch was one of his pupils. Oh, what you see on the right hand side, maybe Marek has already been to. It's the Church of the Holy Mother of God. It's the main patriarchal church in the Kumkapu district of Constantinople. So Hovannes Skolod, born in 1678, died in 1741. This is the end of the Dark Ages for Armenians. In fact, many people may argue that the Dark Ages weren't quite so dark, but there is an intellectual renaissance that is brewing. This is just before the Mechitarist congregation came into being. Often people say it was the Venetian fathers who brought about the Armenian, the Armenian uh, revival. It wasn't just the Mechitarists. It started in Constantinople. The, the Mechitarists also were founded in Constantinople. Golod was a great, Golod apparently means short, so he was not a very tall gentleman. Uh, but he's known as Golod, and you know, the, the name is used respectfully. He was otherwise from Baresh, which is Bitlis, uh, in the Van area, I, I believe, or somewhere there. Uh, so he reconstructed and expanded many churches. He was full of energy, and he had a vision. He founded the two presses, he founded the Skola Kantorum, and Nalyan was one of his many pupils. But he is considered the person who initiated and stimulated this revival of education, of learning, of scholarship in Constantinople, which is, you know, what we've been studying this semester is one of the fruits of what was enabled by. Uh, the patriarch of Aneskorod, Parishensi. Nalian served as Constantinople during two periods, and in between, he served as patriarch of Constantinople before returning to Constantinople to be patriarch again. Now, in the case of Nalian, in addition to the good things that he did, expanding education, printing, Etc. He was himself a very, very brilliant writer, uh, a wonderful scholar, and he tried also to um, provide an Armenian answer to all the Catholic theology that was beginning to have an influence on Armenians. So he had the intellectual caliber to be able to give theological answers and arguments. But uh, it is clear from his writings that he was also influenced by the Catholics. He was an extremely highly educated 
very, very intellectually gifted man. And uh, for example, he has a massive two volume commentary on the book of Lamentation and the Encomia uh, of St. Gregory of Narek. Encomium is Nerpor. It is a work that is written in praise of someone, right? like a panegyric. And, uh, you know, he takes one line from a prayer by St. Gregory of Narek from the Madian Vor Perkutian, from the Book of Lamentation, and he meditates for pages and pages about it. And he also cites from Catholic theologians, but he has to be careful in case he's himself accused of being someone who sympathizes with the Catholics. So we, he always makes the point of saying why the Catholics are wrong in some things, but when they agree with what he wants to say, he makes use of their, their theology. So I often get the impression that he is using one line by St. Gregory of Narek as a point of departure to present and develop his own theological ideas. I am convinced that several wonderful PhD theses can be written on his commentary on the Book of Lamentation by St. Gregory of Narek, but he has other theological volumes as well. I believe there may even be still unpublished manuscripts of his. I don't know if they've survived or not, um, but he was a brilliant, brilliant man. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to say that during the exhibition of old Armenian books uh, that I curated at the Clementinum in 2016, in October 2016, we also had Nalyan's commentary. And you can see these illustrations and the ornamentation of the first page of the analysis um, from the book. And he, uh, he knew, even though he had written a massive work, that all he was doing was, uh, in his very modest way, uh, presenting a gateway to the work of St. Gregory of Narek. So referring to the Book of Lamentation by St. Gregory of Narek, he wrote, to those holy words of gold, I gave explanations of copper. Or to a palace of diamonds, I provided gates of clay. It was also in Constantinople, not in Venice or anywhere else, that the Editio Princeps, the first printed edition of the Book of Lamentation by St. Gregory of Marek was published in 1702. Uh, you can see it here. This too, we had a copy coming from the National Library of Armenia uh, to the Czech Republic to be displayed at my exhibition. If you have my catalog from that uh, uh, exhibition, uh, there are photographs and information about those volumes. Um, anyone who has attended my courses will already know quite a lot about uh, St. Gregory of Narek and the Monastery of Narek. This is a pre-genocide photograph of it. Um, and the great commentator on the Book of Lamentation other than Patriarch Nalyan was the Mechitarist Armenian father of San Lazaro, Father Capriel Abedikian. And it is interesting that he too wrote something uh, comparable uh, at the end of the preface to his own commentary. He said, the height as well as the depth of this admirable artistic volume ever exceed the length of cord of any seeking to measure it. Let's talk about the Mechitarians then. Mechitar Sepastatsi uh, was born in Sepastia, Sebast, later Savaz. Um, he sought education and enlightenment. He traveled to all sorts of places including a brief period in Sevan, uh, the monastery there uh, on the island, now a peninsula, 
in the middle of Sevana Lij, which exists. It's in the middle of present day post-Soviet Armenia. Um, he even ended up in Cyprus. He became very ill and he spent some time at the monastery of St. Macarius, Magaravank, uh, which I know from my childhood, although after the 1974 invasion, it was almost entirely destroyed by the Turks and continues to exist as a ruin now. Uh, so Mkhitar Sebastati even spent some time in Cyprus, recovering from illness. Um, eventually, he uh, ended up in Constantinople, and he had uh, befriended various educated clergy of his time, some of whom were indeed Catholic. And, but he was full also of humanist ideas. And he adopted Catholicism, although with, with his own position, as that of the Mechitarist order that he founded, we get the impression that it's not as if the Mechitarists wanted to make all Armenians Catholic. Rather, they wanted to demonstrate to the Catholic Church that there was nothing un-Catholic un -Catholic about the Armenian Church. Uh, and so every time they printed books, the Mechitarist fathers in Venice, they would say, written during the reign of the Catholicos of Echmiadzin, of such and such a name. They did this until relatively recently, when eventually the Armenian Catholic Church became officially recognized, then they were no longer able to do it. But in a sense, you could say that that was a bit of a blow, a bit of a reverse for, for them because that created an Armenian Catholic Church that was different from the Armenian Orthodox Church. Um, so you could say that in some ways, the relationship of the Mechita, of, Mechita, of Sebast to Catholicism is, is quite a subtle thing that is not always well understood by commentators. So he gathered a group of uh, dedicated Armenian men who wish to pursue scholarship and spirituality. And the order was founded very early in the 18th century in Constantinople. Um, eventually, they settled in Venice and on the island of San Lazaro of Venice, which the Mokhitarist fathers developed and expanded. So they have been based on that island in Venice from 1717. We celebrated 300 years. Uh, the Mkhitaryist fathers organized the conference at which I was invited uh, speaker and important papers were presented. Now, after Mkhitar Sepastatsi died, he was the founding abbot some of the brethren uh, did not approve of some of the actions of his successor, and they left. It was, in fact, the majority who left. And so there was a split in the brotherhood. Those who left uh, eventually, uh, initially um, had their monastery in Tri Trieste, but when Trieste was no longer safe, they had to move, and they've been based in Vienna since 1810. Happily, the two brotherhoods, the one in Venice and one in Vienna, were reunited in the year 2000. So now there is one Mechitarist congregation uh, with a monastery in Venice and another monastery in Vienna but they are all brothers. One or two little interesting things. Uh, the, Vienna, sorry, the Venice Mechitarists were associated with Lord Byron. Lord Byron, who fought alongside the Greeks in the Greek War of Independence and died in 1821. Um, now, the well-known 
painter Ivazovsky, whose brother was a Mkhitaryist father, um, imagined what it was like when Lord Byron first visited San Lazaro. It is said that he would go there regularly. He would sometimes swim there. And he studied ancient Armenian with Father um, Abutyun Avkerian. Um, in a westernized form, he appears as an author as Father Pascal Aucher. And in fact, together they published a very useful still today textbook uh, written in, uh, in English of uh, Krapar of ancient Armenian. Um, the Mkhitaryists had several things as their ideals. In some ways, you could say they were Christian humanists. They were extremely hardworking. They believed in learning, education, and scholarship. They produced high quality editions on the basis of manuscripts of Armenian uh, works of history, spirituality, and so forth, uh, theology uh, as well. They gathered a lot of manuscripts, or when they couldn't obtain a manuscript, they would copy things from manuscripts and send those texts to San Lazaro for brothers who were scholars to make use of them for their editions. Um, they translated a lot of things from Latin, ancient Greek, English, French into Armenian or into ancient Armenian. They have magnificent translations of Homer, of Virgil, um, many authors. Sometimes they translated the, th the same thing more than once as well. But they opened a lot of schools. Paris, elsewhere in France, Italy, the Raphael Murat School. The building is still there. It still belongs to the Mkhitaryists. Unfortunately, due to a lack of interest on the part of Armenians, the school had to close a few decades ago, but it is still there. Daniel Varoujan, the very great Western Armenian poet who died uh, during the genocide in 1915, uh, he was killed but he was a student at that school. And their spirituality, remember, for three centuries, they have been able to pray every day and have services, an unbroken liturgical tradition. Whereas most Armenian monasteries were destroyed, and those in Eastern Armenia, they were closed or suffered because of the Soviet era, so Vienna and especially Venice has a, a three century unbroken tradition of liturgical devotion, prayer and sacred music. Um, there are some important personages from the Vienna and the Venice Mkhitaryists and others associated with them, such as, for example, the Venetian Italian musician Pietro Bianchini, who transcribed a lot of their melodies, which would have otherwise been lost. Um, there is no time now for me to speak in detail uh, about them. This is the scene portrayed by Ivazovsky. Uh, the arrival of Lord Byron to San Lazaro, you can see the father's you know, he's an English lord, a very important person. They are there in full force to greet him, including some very senior people. This is a detail. I took those photographs in Armenia when I was there to um, uh, lecture at the Madenataran Institute October 2019, just before the pandemic. It's uh, This uh, painting is uh, displayed in the National Gallery of Armenia, which is well worth visiting. I don't know if Arpine has been. Askain Batgerasra, they call it, I think. Uh, yes, I, I have been there, but 
it has been already it, it was like five five or six years ago right yeah Crazy. they have some really wonderful things there so uh, i photographed their main gates to the san lazaro monastery on the left hand side this is again from my own photograph the one on the left not the, the ones on the right are not my own photos they are aerial photographs but i took this and they had just painted or gilded the uh, angels and the insignia at the top of the gate um, this is what the island looks like on the top right hand side uh, corner and the monastery you can see at the bottom and the church where they have services and the church tower uh, i mentioned about the split and the unification uh, a very fine authority uh, on the history of the Mechitarist fathers is a, a good friend of mine, a very eminent professor at UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles, Dr. Sebu Arslanyan. And he has published some important articles about the circumstances of the split between the uh, Vienna branch and the Venice branch. Uh, and there's a forthcoming book by Cebu, uh, of which I've seen uh, a draft. And so anything of his written on the subject of the Mkhitaryists is really uh, very, very well worth reading and taking seriously. I already said that they published a lot of books, uh, scholarly editions, translations, dictionaries. Um, now, the Vienna branch developed particularly in uh, the direction of linguistics and the study of the Armenian language, focusing on classical Armenian in a way defined, you know, in terms of quite a narrow uh, temporal window. So you will notice if you attend a service at the Vienna Church of St. Mary the Protector, that the Mechitarist fathers in Vienna will not say Der Vormia, Lord have mercy, but Der Vormiats using the classical form of the second person singular imperative of the verb vohormim because it ends in im so it should be yats the imperative whereas the form der vohormia is slightly later and in fact the emeritus abbot father bosco janian in vienna is uh, the finest uh, specialist in classical Armenian defined in this sense, uh, known to me. Uh, Vienna also had a remarkable polymath, Father Andon Uchkardashian, who passed away in the beginning of 19th century, but some of his writings, he taught mathematics, architecture, music. They were really geniuses, those people. They would keep up with developments in Western science, um, and learn and teach. The other very important thing that the Mkhitaryists did is they, they rendered the service. I mean, they made Armenian culture known to Europe and European culture known to Armenia, which is a very great service indeed in its own right. But in addition, they uh, translated into Latin some international works by people such as Philo of Alexandria, the great Jewish philosopher who wrote in Greek some of his works and certain other important works were not preserved in the original Greek but only in Armenian translation and the Mechitarist fathers translated these things into Latin to make them available to international scholarship. Now because my own research uh, entails amongst other things in fact it has a central place uh, the writings of St. Gregory of Narek. I'm very interested in, in the uh, work that the Mechitarists did. And the Editio Princeps of the Odes, Darp, of St. Gregory of Narek, may be considered this Aotamadzuits, this prayer book, this illustrated prayer book, Aotamadzuits, published by the Mechitarist fathers in Venice in 1804. It has only about half of the Odes. Uh, and of course, uh, Father Capriel Avedikian, whose picture you saw a moment ago, uh, I'll 
display it again in a moment. He published a very fine commentary on the Book of Lamentation in 1801 and an expanded improved edition in 1827, uh, from which you can see those pages. This also we displayed in Prague at the Clementinum. Um, he followed that with another volume with a commentary on the litanies and the encomia. And the Mukhtarist fathers, and I'm sure uh, Father Capriel Averikian was involved, uh, published the first reasonably complete edition of all the saints' writings in 1827. You can see a page above, and an expanded edition in 1840. And you can see the difference. If you look up here on at the old Havun Art Nazial, you can see that it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, is this nine? I think it is nine verses, nine stanzas, whereas the 1840 edition has all 13. And some of the odes that they didn't yet have in 1827, they already included in 1840. And this was the main source for the edition published by my late teacher, Zareh Srpazan, Archbishop Zareh Haznaborian of Blessed Memory in 2003, the millennial edition that appeared 1,000 years after the saint's death. Now, there, were, there are some interesting things. If you compare the manuscripts the Mechitarist fathers had when they were producing their editions, you find that there are sometimes passages that you don't find in any of their manuscripts or there are bits that are in the manuscripts they already had, but which are not in the printed editions. The last is easy to explain. All the time they were receiving more manuscripts and they could not really know everything that was in there and use it for the printed editions. One interesting thing is that their great dictionary that remains unsurpassed to this day, the three Archimandrites dictionary, the Yerit Vartabedats, Nor Partir Kai Gazian Lesvi, um, has a supplement which includes some new words that they found in manuscripts that they had not yet noted before when they sent most of the dictionary to be printed. But how do we explain the phenomenon that you can find things in the printed editions that are not included in the manuscript that they had? Well, this piece of paper that I found inside one of their manuscript, bound manuscripts explains it. It's a letter from one of their friends and agents. They would have people who would go around historical Armenia, various monasteries, try to get manuscripts, but if they couldn't, they would borrow the manuscript and copy certain parts and send those things to the fathers in Venice. So this way, their printed editions embody readings and variants and passages in manuscripts in Ottoman Armenia that have been destroyed now, which makes the printed editions even more valuable to us. This is what their scriptorium there it looks like. Uh, I mean, it's a scriptorium not in the sense that manuscripts are written and produced there, but they're kept and stored and well looked after. It's a round building, marvelous place. Um, the pioneer in all this was Mkhitar Sepastatsi. He published a marvelous dictionary of which an expanded and improved version is that of the uh, three Archimandrites from the first quarter of the 19th century. Yes, Marco? I, I'm very sorry. I, I need to go for another meeting at eight o'clock soon. Right. I've got another four minutes though, haven't I? Yes, for, for four minutes. Yeah. I will make good use of those four minutes. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will pass over some of this material. This is Father Capriela Vedikian, Minas Pejeshkian, who was a polymath as well. He wrote on a lot of subjects, including the monograph on music. Uh, this was the abbot, Father Ignatius Gurerian, remarkable person. He edited a volume that has all the hymns and prayers and uh, appropriate biblical readings. Um, 
and he managed to ensure that the neumes, the musical symbols that we can't read, were reproduced as faithfully as possible, a typographical miracle almost. 1898, look at the different delicate variations that he tried to represent. Bianchini, the Venetian musician who was involved with the Mujicari fathers from the mid 1850s, uh, uh, took down some melodies. This manuscript that I myself found during my research, he has uh, transcribed insipids from the singing of the abbot. He was perhaps not yet abbot then, Father Ignatius Gurerian. And uh, this Italian musician, Venetian musician, was really impressed by the Armenian sacred music on which he spent a long time. And he described that the chants, when uh, performed properly, are sublime and celestial. Dayan, uh, Father Revon Dayan, uh, published the hymnal in Western notation. He had friendships with important Italian composers such as Gianfrancesco Malipiero, Father Saak Gemjemian, whom I'm afraid I was not lucky enough to meet. He was the abbot, he died at a young age. He produced catalogs that I use every day. May his memory be blessed. Father Vertanes, next to whom I sang, he is not with us anymore, unfortunately. He recorded all the hymns on digitally. They're, they've been recorded, which is a very great treasure. So a little something about Vienna, uh, what they considered to be the true Tassaganhair and classical Armenian narrow period from 407 to 450. Uh, very interesting. And they say there were Ormiats, instead of there were as I said. Father Andon Uchkardashian, he made a remarkable study of the Armenian neumes and Byzantine neumes. I've been studying the manuscript. Uh, this is Father Simon singing a melody for me at my request and opening this uh, bookcase of precious medieval manuscripts. Protestants. They didn't want to be Protestants. The Armenian Evangelical Church was founded only because under pressure from the Amiras, the patriarch of the day excommunicated a group of spiritual Armenians who wished to translate and to be educated, something that much of the church was not really in tune with. And they reluctantly founded the Armenian uh, Evangelical Church and the main pastor was my great, great, great uncle Apisohom Utujian. And his two brothers, Simon Utujian and Stepan Utujian, were also involved. All three brothers were pastors. And the teacher was Pikor Badveli Peshtimaljian, who was not himself Protestant, but he had Protestant friends. He was a precursor to Protestants. The amazing thing, though, is that in the milieu of Constantinople, this person with Protestant sympathies and the Catholic Hamparzum Limonjan devised an Armenian ode in praise of the Virgin Mary called Diragidzim Buis, which is a contrafactum to a Turkish Ottoman melody associated with such Turks as Dede Effendi, although we're not sure who wrote it. And this is from the foundation. I'm not sure which of those is Apisol Mitujan, but he was young at the time. He was, I think, not yet 29. And my great my great great grandfather, Stepan Utujan, who wrote the books and edited the journals, is this gentleman here. Uh, Puragan, this is what he edited. And this is his grave that I found in Feriko in Constantinople. Uh, and this is the score of that Piradzin Buis, and that is the Ottoman version. And this is Baba Hamparzumli Monjan. With Ormanyan, I already said something to you. But he developed a close working relationship with the Sultan Abdul Hamid. I, 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 I had to leave now. It's, it's just, okay. Yeah, well, we have to thank you for your attention, Marku and Arpine. Have a very Merry Christmas and a blessed and healthy New Year. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I I'm looking forward to to the next one. Have a blessed uh, Christmas and uh, happy New Year. Thank you to you too, uh, Marku.
Uh, can you keep the recording of this? I would like to have it, please. Yes, yes, I, I will keep it. Thank you. A very good evening to you. See you soon. Bye. Bye.